thank you for coming for our month to, to our monthly core bug meeting. Uh, it's a great pleasure. It's a great pleasure to, to introduce um, Amit Deshwar, who's from the Morse Lab, who's going to talk to us about evolutionary evolution of tumors. Thank you very much. Uh, I want to thank Corbug uh, for giving me this opportunity to talk about my work. Um, and I want to thank uh, the people I've done this work with, uh, uh, Shankar Bambu, Jack Winter Singer, uh, and Quaid Morris uh, at the University of Toronto, and uh, Wei Zhao, Christine Young, Ben Hojang, and Lincoln Stein at the Ontario Institute of Cancer Research. All right, so that was my talk, reconstructing the evolutionary history of tumors. Um, every time a cell replicates, uh, on average, there's like 1.1 errors that are introduced uh, in part of that replication. And so every cell in your body actually has a unique genotype, closely related, but, uh, but uh, unique. And so every cell contains this set of private, uh, set of private mutations that normally don't have any functional impact. But when a driver mutation hits that starts the process of tumor uh, development and progression, here is shown as the M, uh, the diagram. Uh, the implication of this is that when not only are there lots of cells with that driver mutation, but all those cells also contain those private mutations that the founding cell had um, when the driver mutation happened. Uh, and now this process of accumulating passenger mutations followed by a driver mutation that causes an expansion in both the driver and the passenger mutations uh, often happens more than once in tumor development. So here, satellite diagram, happens again, and now you have two subpopulations in the same tumor. Um, I'm just going to pause for a second to talk specifically about what mutations are present in those yellow cells uh, at the bottom row. They contain not only the driver and passenger mutations of the founding, uh, the founding yellow cell, but also the driver and passenger mutations of the founding white cell um, up at the top. And that will be sort of important later. Uh, and now this process uh, doesn't happen just, just twice. It can happen over and over again. And then at the end, when a tumor is diagnosed or something like that, uh, you have multiple subpopulations with distinct uh, but related genotypes. And each of those different genotypes give those different subpopulations differing abilities to invade, metastasize, and to uh, resist treatment. And so the problem that I'm working on, subclinal reconstruction, is giving one or a small number of bulk tumor samples um, from the tumor down at the end, can we figure out what those different genotypes present in the sample are? So how might we do this? Uh, one of the most important pieces of information is the somatic uh, variant allele frequency. So we can figure out what somatic mutations are present in the tumor by uh, sequencing blood. And then you can get a germline or reference genome, and then you can look for reads that disagree with that reference genome in the tumor sample. And so here, uh, we have reference genome up at the top. This locus is a G, but then you get the reads from the tumor, a bunch of the reads at that position uh, contain an A and Z. Uh, and then we can quantify that by just counting the number of reads containing that somatic mutation uh, and dividing by the total number of reads, and we get what's called the variant of the frequency. Um, Oh, so this is just for a single mutation, but there's lots of somatic mutations in cancer. Uh, so here on the left, different stylized view showing tumor evolution. Subpopulation A leads to <coughs> subpopulation B, and in turn develops in subpopulations C and D. Um, and just remember from the slide before, each of those diamonds that represent a set of mutations defining that, mut that subpopulation, there's not just one or two uh, driver mutations, but the entire set uh, of passenger plus driver mutations for that subpopulation. Now you take a tumor sample here, and then you sequence it, figure out the somatic mutations, compute the VAF, those different uh, somatic mutations, and you put them on a histogram, and you get something that you see here on the right, where for each of the subpopulations you get a peak in the histogram. Uh, and so, so on the x-axis is the very allele frequency, and the y-axis is the number of x-axis. All right, so now that we have this histogram, how can we reconstruct the genotypes? Uh, there's two tasks. The first task is to identify the VAF clusters. So here, we identify those four VAF clusters, and then for each cluster, we identify the central or mean uh, VAF associated with that cluster. Uh, some algorithms stop here, 
but to us, that doesn't really go far enough because it doesn't actually tell you what genotypes are present. That you've identified, say you identify this clusters A and B in a sample, but that doesn't tell you if in the tumor sample there are cells that contain mutations that's A and B together in the same cell, or there's some cells that contain just A and some cells that contain just B. So to do that, you have to place these VAF clusters in a phylogenetic tree. <coughs> in order to do that, you need to convert between variant allele frequency to the proportion of cells that contain that mutation. Now, if you assume that there's no copy number changes, this is easy. You just multiply the VAF by 2, and that gives you an estimate of the proportion of cells containing that mutation. So here, the, v, the central VAFs for the four clusters here, multiplied by 2, the proportion of cells <coughs> containing the mutation. And then we place them in the phylogenetic tree. And then once you have that phylogenetic tree, you can figure out what the genotypes for each of the subpopulations are. Uh, unfortunately, there's often multiple phylogenetic trees consistent with the same uh, VAF data. So here, this other phylogenetic tree, which is the right phylogenetic tree, actually has the same uh, expected VAF as this, as this linear uh, phylogeny at the top. And so with this sort of ambiguity in reconstruction, it's important that in whatever method you do, uh, you're aware of which parts of your reconstruction you're certain of, or if you're certain that there's a subpopulation that contains just mutation sets A, and you're certain that there's a subpopulation that contains uh, mutation sets A and B together, but that you're aware of which parts you're not certain of, so you don't know if there's a subpopulation that contains A, B, and D, or a subpopulation that contains A, B, C, and D. So whatever method you use, you have to be careful about that ambiguity. Now, uh, this that I just talked about is an algorithm called PhiloSub, uh, that we published uh, in 2014. Uh, and it makes the assumption that I made over there, where there's no SSS, if there's no copy number changes, you can just multiply it by two, that's not really a safe assumption to make in cancer. Uh, lots of tumors have lots of copy number changes, and that changes the relationship between variant allele frequency and the proportion of cells that uh, contain that mutation. So here I'm showing just five out of the 11 possible ways that the CMBs and SSMs can interact. And the key thing is that the way that that relationship between variant allele frequency and proportion of cells containing that frequency changes depends not only on the specifics of the copy number alteration, which from which it, how many copies, etc., but also on the evolutionary relationship between the SSM and the copy number change. So uh, like the second and third row show two cases where you have the same cellular composition, same SSM, same copy number alteration, this amplification of the blue strand, but uh, on the top case, the CMB occurred after the SSM, so the variant was amplified, while in the third row, the SSM occurred after, so there's only one copy of it. And so even though everything else is the same, the evolutionary relationship changed the expected variant of the old frequency from 40 to, from 40 to 20 percent. Okay, so. We developed an algorithm called PhiloWGS that uh, integrates subclonal, there's plenty of seats up at the front, people standing in the back, uh, an algorithm that integrates subclonal CMB calls from algorithms like Theta, Clone HD, or Titan into our reconstruction and then corrects the variant allele frequencies based on where those CMBs are placed in the phylogeny. Um, and then you get inferred phylogeny, where we have a full SSM and CMB defined genotype for each subpopulation, prevalence uh, in the sample, and stuff like that. Uh, it's a fully Bayesian method, we do MCMC sampling, and so we're able to identify which parts of our reconstruction we're certain of and which parts are not. Uh, I don't have time to talk uh, too much about results, but I'll just show you one slide. Um, this slide compares three algorithms um, ours, PhiloWGS, uh, which does phylogenetic correction for uh, CMBs. Uh, PyClone, which does some correction for CMBs, but not in a phylogenetic way. And Cyclone, which does no correction for copy number alterations. Um, this data is from a breast tumor sequence of 288x, 288x coverage, uh, full genome. And on the left, you see the performance measured by uh, clonal uh, clustering accuracy for the SSMs located only in regions with normal copy number. And you can see that all three algorithms do basically the same. And on the right, you see the same performance measure, but this time looking at all SSMs, including the SSMs <coughs> in regions of 
uh, clonal copy number change and subclonal copy number change. And you can see that PhiloWGS does basically the same as before, both high clone and side clone be worse. Uh, showing the utility uh, in doing this full phylogenetic correction for copy number alterations. Okay, so in, in conclusion, basically you can use PhiloWGS to do subclonal reconstruction based on whole genome sequencing data. Um, we're the first method to perform this type of phylogenetic reconstruction, integrating both CNVs and SSMs. Um, if you're interested, you can check out our paper. It's on archive in this Google file <coughs> WGS for result number one. The paper was just uh, accepted this week, so you'll see it coming out soon. Uh, and the code is available on the Morris Lab GitHub account uh, if you want to play around with it. Um, what are we doing from here? Um, one is we're taking this algorithm and we're applying it as part of the pan-cancer analysis of whole genomes project. Where we're looking at, I think the slide is out of date, I think it's up to 2300 uh, whole genome sequences of tumor normal pairs um, and trying to figure out what the, sub, what the subclonality looks across a bunch of different cancer types. Uh, we're incorporating what we call linkage in our reconstruction where you have reads that span uh, multiple SSMs. Sometimes with short with like short read technology, you can get lucky and they're close together. Or we're looking at using uh, different long read technologies and look where we have reads that'll span uh, multiple SSMs. That lets you know that two mutations are present in the same cell. Uh, and then how to visualize and represent the uncertainty in our reconstructive phylogenies. Um, oh, I guess one last plug before I thank the institutions is that if you think this is a cool problem. Uh, Dream is launching a somatic heterogeneity uh, challenge. I think the website might be live already, but if not, it'll be very soon, where you'll be able to develop your own algorithms to this reconstruction and compete uh, in like an impartial environment uh, against, against other developers. Okay, thank you institutions. I mean, it's possible. University of Toronto, uh, NSERC, the Morris Lab, and Ontario Institute for Cancer Research. With that, uh, I'll take any questions you have. Thank you. Uh, in your last slide, where you showed the performance of each of the algorithms, yeah. how, did you, uh, how did you perform the validation? <laughs> so for this, this paper, um, like history of 21 breast tumors, they did a bunch of uh, semi-manual analysis where they uh, did different clusterings and figure out what the different clonal and subclonal uh, CMVs were. And we're able to group uh, the somatic mutations into one of four uh, subpopulations. And then this is just measuring the, uh, the AUPR between the true co-clustering matrix across the SSMs and then the inferred uh, co-clustering matrix from the different algorithms. So there's no, there's no I guess, independent uh, validation on this data set. But as part of the, uh, the dream challenge, we're going to be validating, in some cases, with single cell sequencing data. So uh, that's what I was wondering if okay. you have done, uh, you have just tested how closely your prediction matches uh, results when you get from single cell sequencing data. So unfortunately, there's not that much uh, whole genome single cell sequencing uh, data published yet. It's kind of in the pipeline. <coughs> Um, and it'll be coming out soon. Uh, there's there's some, and we're working on that uh, kind of as part of the, the dream challenge to identify good data sets for, for uh, validation. Yeah. Uh, this is maybe a philosophical question, I'm not sure, but uh, I'm just wondering if you think there's any value in having, rather than the precise tree, or an output, maybe it's something on the distribution of potential trees, if there's any value in keeping track of that information. I'm not sure what the metric would be, or the size of the tree, the shape of the tree, or whatever, but is that something you can track? Yeah, so there's there's kind of two parts. One is we can look at like gross measures of clonality and subclonality as a way of indicating uh, something about the tumor development, um, that it's like more aggressive or more mutation prone than others, and then we can try to see if that matches with something about survival uh, or disease or drug response or whatever. And the other thing is, in terms of looking at the distribution over sample trees, like we, we capture all that. Uh, the problem when you have like thousands of SSMs and not very high read depth 
is that no sample tree is identical to any other sample tree, even if you just look at the assignments and the phylogenetic relationships. And so we're working on ways of trying to cluster those so that we can kind of identify, like identify modes in our distribution over trees uh, to try to summarize that. We can look at the whole, like the whole sampling run, but that's impossible to like visualize in a, in a meaningful way. Um, I'm wondering whether it's actually important clinically or otherwise to reconstruct the full tree, right? What people care is about is the initiating cell population, um, some more aggressive clones, and so the rate, uh, some of the clones that are more aggressive, and basically the final, which ones prediction about how it's going to progress, but does it really matter what happens in the middle to anybody? Well, the thing is that if you want to figure out what genotypes are present at the current time point where you take the sample or wherever, you have to know what the genotypes of the ancestral populations were. Uh, like in the, too far back there, if you don't know what the genotype of like a middle ancestor is, you don't know what the genotype of the descendant populations are. So our goal isn't to reconstruct the history because we think the history itself is interesting, although maybe it is. Um, but if you, our goal is just to figure out what genotypes are actually, what distinct genotypes are present uh, at the time of the tumor collection. But to, and to do that, you have to do this reconstruction. We should probably move along. Thank you very much for uh, giving this great talk and your certificate. No. All right. Thank you. <laughs>